Hi, I'm Pastor Scott, pastor of the Oasis Church. Listen, we are so excited that you decided to join us for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. We just pray that this will stir your affections towards Christ, but we have one encouragement we want to leave you with. Please do not allow this to take the place of the local body of believers. We pray that you will be involved in a local congregation, a local church that you can find yourself submitting under the eldership and the leadership of a local church. We pray that you will find yourself stirred towards Christ and that your joy in Christ will be ever increasing. Enjoy. Last week, we as a church looked at that incredibly difficult passage to understand. That passage where Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, the sinless, spotless man, fully man, truly man, truly God, called a Gentile woman a dog. And you remember her response. Yes, Lord. Oh, that we would have Yes, Lord, on our prayers more than whatever else we pray. And this was a high point in Mark last week. At the end of chapter 7, this Gentile, immoral, scandalous woman saying, Yes, Lord, because this was the first time in the Gospel of Mark that a human uttered, Lord, to Jesus. The disciples, Jesus' own disciples, spending 24-7 traveling, walking with Jesus over and over, will not call him Lord until what we saw this week in our reading plan, chapter 8. And we'll get to that in two weeks. So recognize this beautiful, gospel-oriented truth that the Gentile, immoral, scandalous woman understood who Jesus was before his own disciples. Jesus has a mission. His mission is to reveal himself to his disciples so that they may know who God is. And there is a great glory in the church because we get to worship the holy God, the God of the universe, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the God who knit you together from womb to tomb and all the way into eternity. That God, the unlimited God, that is who we worship. And the disciples of Jesus Christ, you and I, if we claim to know Christ, are never content in our knowledge of him. We are always learning, always growing, always deepening in our faith. The walk with Jesus Christ is not for the faint-hearted, and it is not for the sissies. Because when you walk with Jesus, you realize this one truth. I can't do this. And I say, welcome to the club. You now have an understanding. And what great joy it is where Jesus looks at us and says, yeah, but I can. Amen. And that's where our hope is. And I know as we read through this passage in our reading plan this week, we kind of scratched our head at the disciples a little bit. And we're like, how do these guys not get it? Because you and I are just so perfect, right? <laughs> right? We just get it all the time, right? No, none of us have been corrected. None of us have been wrong. And so this morning, I want to start our discussion, because what we're going to look at is what true worship is. In order to understand what true worship is, we have to understand what the church is. The church, the people of God, the elect that God chose before the foundation of the earth are on this earth for one purpose and one purpose only. To fix the world? Wrong. Jesus already did that. To do what? To glorify God in all things, through all things, for his name. We want his name to be shouted from the rooftops and in the valleys to everyone that they may know who Christ is. One of my favorite texts on the church is found in the book of Ephesians. I call Ephesians, by the way, the like mini Romans, right? Like it's kind of all the great parts of Romans shoved into six chapters. This is what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 
Do you notice what Paul did there? To him be the glory where? In the church and then in Christ Jesus. So what does that tell us? That God is most glorified through the people of God coming together for the worship of God. To him be the glory. The only ones who bring glory to God on this world is the elect, the church, God's people. Worship brings us into contact with the majesty and the greatness of God. Without worship, without true worship, we will never see the glory and the greatness of God. Without worship, we will never be in awe and amazement of who Jesus is. And let me share with you this morning, and I'm going to preach so countercultural this morning. Without the church, without the church, it is impossible to glorify God. Right. The church is God's plan for bringing glory to all corners of the earth. The church and the glory of God are inseparable from one another. Two sides of one coin. And so this is the glory of God in the church and in worship. When we stop looking to ourselves and we start looking to others. You didn't believe me. I didn't think you would. I knew you were like, nope, it's all about me. So here you go. Philippians 2. Count others more significant than yourselves. Look not only to your interest, but to the interest of others. That's one verse. Cool. Romans 15, 1. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and to not please ourselves. Do you know what Paul just did there? He called you out. If you think, come in here, think church is all about me and what I think, Paul's saying you're immature and you have a lot of growing to do. You want to know how you know if you're mature in Christ? You have more excitement and joy seeing the glory of God be filled in others through your service. And here's the cool thing God does. When you do that, when you lift others up, God fills your cup and it overflows. Amen. I still don't believe you. Cool. 1 John 3, 16. No greater love than this, than Christ laid down his life for us. So we also ought to lay down our lives for one another. There is great glory. There is worship. When our greatest desire is to see other people come to know the glory of Christ in the church, outside of the church, and in everything we do. Selfish worship produces discussions about preferences. Godly worship cares only about one thing, that God is glorified in others. Godly worship has one goal in mind, that God's glory shines into all the world, into all others, because godly worship delights in the fact that Christ has died, and since Christ has died, we are kind of righteous by his blood, so that becomes the reason and the means of our praise. Amen. When we miss that truth in our worship, we will miss the glory of the church and in Christ, and worship will become about us. Where we fail in worship is when we make worship about us and not about God. When our worship emphasizes us first and then God, disaster will always follow. If you don't believe me, read the book of Exodus. Come back and talk to me. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. We're going to be in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 is going to be our text. We are flying through the book of Mark. We're almost halfway done with the book of Mark. Um, yes, we are skipping a lot. We're going to skip the feeding of the 4,000. It's a repeat of the feeding of 5,000. Don't worry, your home group leaders will explain all the differences between the feedings of the 5,000 and the feedings of the 4,000. I love this fact, y'all, that we have home groups where you can work this stuff out. The stuff we miss on Sunday mornings, you can tear that apart. I was telling Molly, I feel like I study as much for home group as I do Sunday morning because there is a lot of good stuff to go through in our reading plans. And so we're going to go right into the discussion with our friends, the Pharisees, I know that's no one in here except for the one who stands in front of you, the pastor himself. So you all get to hear me as I preach to myself this morning as we look at the Pharisees. But before we do that, we need to pray. Um, God has orchestrated worship with God's people in three main ways. Singing, done, praying, and preaching. So let us pray together as a people of God.
Father God, we come before you and we thank you this morning that you have sent your son to be the propitiation for our sins, that we are counted righteous. We are justified by faith alone, through grace alone, and Christ alone. God, that we have one plea and one plea only, that Christ is our only hope. And so we exalt Christ this morning. Now, church, let's just pray for me. Pray that I'll be helpful to you this morning. Pray that I'll be useful. Pray that I'll be clear. Pray that this morning God will speak through me, that he'll hide me behind and beneath his cross. Now, church, let's just pray for yourself. Pray that God will open up your ears, your heart, and your mind this morning, that he'll remove obstacles, that you'll clearly hear his word being exposited to you this morning. Father God, this time is yours. We pray these things because of your son's atoning work on the cross and the spirit that's alive and active within all who believe. Amen. 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 So if you remember a few weeks ago, we preached on Jesus and his last run in with the Pharisees and he called them out on legalism. And so my whole point on that sermon was to remind you and I of the dangers of legalism. And one of the tall tale signs, this is how you can know you're in the area of legalism or not, is if you get more upset over other people's sins than your own sins. And let me tell you, you're going to try to justify it, right? Again, like I said, you're standing, or the person standing in front of you delivering God's message has battled and fought legalism his whole life. I thought that after a decade of putting to death this sin, it would not be a problem anymore, but it often rears its head. So if you feel like I'm picking on you this morning, know it's because I'm picking on myself. Because I know when I say that, that you're more worried about other people's sins than your own sins, you start to justify it. Yeah, but look at what they're doing. I'm not doing something as bad as that. Well, the Bible calls you out, doesn't it? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For all deserve condemnation and wrath. James tells us what? That if you've broken just one of God's laws, you're guilty of breaking all of God's laws. So therefore what? There is no distinction of that person's worse than I because we all stand before God guilty. And then if you remember, we worked through this a few weeks ago, go check out the sermon, right? What What do we see? That God, that Christ, his greatest judgments are reserved for who? The most immoral people? Absolutely not the self-righteous, legalist people that have tried to work their good works into the kingdom of God. They're the ones who receive the greater judgment. And so this is a stern warning throughout all of Scripture. And we must pay attention when the Bible warns us against us. So we're going to have another run-in with the Pharisees. And I pray that it is as encouraging to you as it was to me as I read over this text. Mark 8, verses 11 through 13. This is the word of the Lord. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. So let's recap. Jesus is coming back from his journey to Gentile territory. Remember last week we talked about how he went to the area of Tyre and Sidon. That wasn't like going next door. He took a month-long journey into Tyre and Sidon, and he had one mission, and that was to cast a demon out of a little girl who he never even met. He met Mama. And if you remember what we said last night, where the prayers of the saints are, there is always hope. But what this beautiful story reminded you and me of from last week is Jesus did this to the most immoral person we could imagine. The most immoral person you could imagine looks like a Boy Scout compared to this Gentile Canaanite woman. And then what? Then we saw in chapter 8 through our reading plans, he goes to the Decapolis, was the Decapolis, a Gentile and Jew area, and he feeds the 4,000 full of Gentiles and Jews. And so we have seen so far in Mark two miraculous feedings, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. 
feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000. And so why is this important? Why is the end of Mark 7 and the beginning of Mark 8 so important? Because Paul is going to pick up the same thing in Ephesians chapter 2, that Christ has come down and he has torn down the wall of hostility that divides us. And if you remember, you can imagine Jesus and his disciples, they're like, why did we take a month-long journey so you can speak a demon out of a girl who you never met. We could have done that from Israel. Why did we take a month-long journey? You can imagine the argument, right? There are plenty of problems here in Israel, Jesus. Why did we go outside of Israel to Tyre and Sidon? Because Jesus has come to say there are no more borders for the Christian because you've been called out of this world and into the kingdom of God. So you do not see borders because the gospel goes to all nations. Amen. Revelation says every tribe, tongue, nation, and language will be around the glory seat. So you and I have a directive to take the gospel to all of the nations. And the promise of the Old Testament is what? The glory of God will cover the world like water covers the sea. Isn't that a great hope? Our 1040 window will have the glory of God shining amidst it. And he comes back. He goes. He feeds the 4,000. Great miraculous moment happens. And just like in your life and in my life and in Jesus' life, often following a mountaintop experience, the valley soon follows. We must be aware, we must be aware that after mountaintop experiences, valleys often follow. We must be aware to never define the glory of God as only happening on the mountain the tops. Because our God is the God who works on the mountaintops as much as he does in the valleys. And yes, the mountaintops are so much more exciting. But the valley moments is where you truly see God do miraculous works. And may I remind you this morning, church, God does not give you the valleys so you may appreciate the mountaintops. That may be cute on a Hallmark card. That's not (laughs) biblical. God gives you the valley so that you can see in the darkest, deepest, worst moments of your life, he is still at work. That God is the God of the mountaintops and the valleys. And as Psalm 23 says, he leads you to the mountaintops and guess where he leads you? Down into the valleys. So do not disregard, those of you who are in a valley right now, do not count God out, for you will see that he is going to shine brightest when it is darkest. And here you see these Pharisees, and they're coming in rank and file. They're coming basically looking like a military. I mean, they're all lined up in rank and file, march in step, because they have a purpose to call out Jesus. So Jesus' mountaintop experience, he's had a great victory, had the woman who he called the dog, yes, Lord. He's like, finally, at least the Gentiles are getting it, praise God. And then he has the feeding of the 4,000. Do you remember back to the feeding of the 5,000 when what? They looked, everyone was hungry, Jesus had compassion, and the disciples had a great idea, a very practical idea to get these people fed. Send them away, Jesus. What's absent in the feeding of the 4,000 is what? Send them away, Jesus. The disciples in the feeding of 4,000 go to Jesus and says, we need help. If you remember in the feeding of 5,000, they leaned onto their own understanding. The feeding of the 4,000, they leaned into Jesus. Ah, Jesus is like, victory! Finally, they're getting it. These stiff-necked, hard-headed people. Again, I'm not preaching to anyone in this room but the one preaching himself, because none of you are hard-headed and stiff-necked. And so here come these Pharisees. And what do they demand but a sign? Jesus, you owe us a sign. Now, if you were to read just Mark chapter 8, never read Mark chapter 1 through 7, this is actually a perfectly fine demand. Why? We've read it in Deuteronomy the last few weeks. Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 18. This should be familiar to you. The command of God is that when a prophet comes, you are to demand a sign. And when that sign comes to fruition, you will know that he is from God. But if it does not come, you stone that sucker because you don't want that evil to spread around you. We've read this, Deuteronomy 13 and 18. But here's the problem. 
These guys have already been given a sign. Remember, if you remember back to Mark chapter 3, what did the Pharisees admit by their own volition? Of course he can cast out demons. He is the prince of demons. They have acknowledged miraculous signs from Jesus already. They have refused to count Jesus as Messiah. Their hearts are hardened. They have refused to be corrected by Jesus. Refusal to be corrected will always result in hardened hearts. Because back in chapter 3, Jesus said, you have missed the point. Right. And they walked away from him. And so therefore, we need to be corrected often. Amen. And do you know who needs to be corrected the most? Yeah, those immoral people out there. Teenagers, kids, they need to be corrected. No, 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 no. The more mature you are in the kingdom of God, the more you have a need to be corrected. Right. If you want to become the greatest in the kingdom, you've got to become the least. Right. God's leaders, the preachers, the pastors, the teachers need the correction more than anyone. Without correction, you will harden your hearts. Never follow a leader and never be a leader who refuses correction. Refusal to be corrected will always result in a hardness of heart. And that hardness of heart will permeate throughout all the people around them. Hard hearts will never be able to glorify God because they'll be so focused on self. How you respond to correction will reveal your heart. Do you welcome correction in your life or do you come up with excuses? Do you deflect correction or do you receive it? Here's what I know about correction. Most people become impenetrable because either A, they've never asked for correction, or B, when it comes up, they'll make up excuses, right. reasons. If it is a brother or sister in Christ who has come to you with correction, I want to encourage you, shut up and listen. Amen. Shut up and listen. Because your immediate response is, I've got to explain, I've got I to defend myself. But man, if they're a brother or sister in Christ, they're doing it for your good and they love you. And so know this, when correction comes, receive it, take it to the Lord and let the Lord speak into that. And, and by the way, don't be one of the, I'm, I'm real quick, sorry, commercial break. Don't be one of those people that are like, I can only be corrected if it's perfectly shown to me. Amen. Homie, if it's a brother or sister in Christ, they love you enough and they're saying, hey, I'm seeing this. Pay attention to that. That's God's mercy. That's God's grace. If you constantly give excuses and justification, your hardness of heart will come, and no one's going to want to correct you. So that's step one in hardening a heart, failure to be corrected. Do more listening than you do talking. Amen. Step two is found right here. Step two in the hardening of heart is what? Demands in worship. When we forget who we worship, when we forget that it's God we worship, we will find ourselves creating demands when it comes to worship. We'll think that our demands must be met first in order to meet with Jesus. When in fact, when we meet with Jesus, our demands melt away. Right. Because we see Jesus clearly. Your demands will blind you from seeing the glory of Christ. Demands in worship is highly presumptuous while worship is highly humbling. Demands in worship will prevent you from truly enjoying the fellowship of the church. You've seen this, right? People have come up to you and they say, well, I tried the church and it didn't work out for me. The better question when it comes to worship is not who's pouring into you, but who are you pouring into? Right. Do you trust God to fill you full through your love for others? Next, I want us to see this word in the text. It says, they came so that they can test him. Circle that word in your Mark journals. That's only used four times in the book of Mark. Three times by the Pharisees, but the first time it's used in the book of Mark, chapter 1, Satan came to test Jesus. Mark is defining for you and I that this is straight evil. Demands in worship is not worship at all. It's veiled unbelief. Think about how weak it is to demand a sign from God when you've been given his holy, perfect word. 
What a sign demands is the fact that God has to prove himself to us. The, the potter has to prove himself to the clay. That's what a demand is in worship. Next, I want us to see that disbelief, hard-heartedness that is expressed in demands is a rejection of the teaching. Remember, it's not works, it's not signs, it's not wonders that bring people to God. It's the teaching and preaching of God's word. You remember back to chapter 1, Jesus says, I came that I can teach. Over and over, he continued on to teach. He continued on to preach. Romans chapter 10 reminds us that it's God's words that call men and women from death to life. To quote Calvin, where a church where the word of God is clearly preached, there is the church, regardless of the faults that swarms with it. Because it is God's words that call people from death to life. And you will hear it. Man, if God would do this, I would believe him. My dear friends, if people are unmoved by the word of God, the whole sea can split in half and they would not believe in him. It is God's word that brings faith. It's God's word that calls us from darkness to life. If we are unmoved by the word of God, we will be unmoved by any sign and wonder from heaven. And we will, in fact, become blind to the signs and wonders that are clearly given. Why? Because this is the great joy of the church. I love God's just great plan here. Because you know what he promises God's church? When you go out and you truly preach and teach God's word, you will see dead men and dead women come to life. You will baptize them and you will see a whole new creation through the preaching and teaching of God's word. Amen. This is the greatest sign here. And this is great joy for the church. And this is where we started. Worship does not demand it gives. It was a great worship of the Son who gave his life to the Father for us. That was his act of worship. I'm laying my life down unto you, O God. Do what you got to do. And the whole wrath of God poured upon the Son so that his church may live. Amen. And this was great worship. Finally, in our little discussion on worship, I want to add this. Worship is not an activity, it's an identity. Right. Worship is not an activity, it is an identity. If you think of worship as only happening on Sunday mornings in home groups, my friend, you are hardening your heart. Worship is both private and corporate. Worship is not about feelings or preferences. It's about the glory and the majesty of God. If you make worship about preferences and feelings, what will follow will always be demand. Demanding what you need, demanding proof, demanding feelings. Yep. Well, pastor, you're grinding, you're grinding your axe and you're swinging at us this morning. I don't like that. Friends, I'm just paraphrasing Jesus. That's, that's the great joy of being a pastor. You just plagiarize Jesus the whole time, right? So here you go. Again, argue with Jesus. Don't argue with me. You want to be one of my disciples? Pick up your cross. Follow me. If you don't know what that looks like, go watch the Passion of the Christ today and there's your view. The whole Christian life is a death to self. When you call on Jesus as Lord, that is the funeral to the world and a delivery room to the church. Amen. Let us not be a people who are still infants in the faith. Let us grow and deepen in the faith. Why? Because the call of the Christian life is to put off ourselves and put on that of Christ, to put off our preferences, to put off our demands and put on the glory and the majesty of Christ. This is sanctification. I must decrease so that he may increase. And this is a glorious act because the more you walk in sanctification, the more you find joy in serving and loving others and the less you care about your preferences and your demands. And so the Christian life is filled with refusing to do wicked things and desiring to do glorious things. And the more we behold Christ and his cross, the more the joy of the Christian walk is. Finally, we see this in this little section, that Jesus walks away from the Pharisees. I want us to understand that Jesus walks away from the Pharisees. Jesus rejects those who have rejected him. He gets in the boat and he has left them. 
Jesus has rejected them. He has moved on. He has turned them over to Satan. He has handed them over. This is a terrifying warning, church. This is a terrifying warning to you and to me to be aware of how we worship, who we worship, and what we worship. Because if we make worship all about us, we will harden our hearts. Paul, by the way, says the same thing in Romans chapter 1. I couldn't choose between Romans chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 5, but um, here we are. Romans chapter 1, Paul says, but although they knew God, so they knew who Jesus was, they did not give honor to him and they did not thank him. And then if you read that stair step, it goes all the way to Paul saying, and so God handed them over to themselves. He left. This is what hardness of heart does. Hardness of heart will finally get to the point where God will hand you over to you. This is the debasement of Romans chapter 1. But remember where Romans chapter 1 starts. Although they knew God, they did not give honor to him, and they did not thank God. My friends, without thanksgiving and gratitude in your prayers you will be missing out on one of the greatest joys of the Christian life. To neglect thanksgiving and gratitude is to neglect the glory of God. The Pharisees show this here. They did not honor Jesus. They did not give thanks to him. They demanded from him. This is why our prayers are filled with thanksgiving. Gratitude and thanksgiving is the greatest weapon in our prayer arsenal. And there will be one final sign these Pharisees will be given according to Matthew. It'll be the sign of Jonah, the resurrection. The resurrection will be the crowning proof that he paid for it all. And so faith is like love. It cannot be proved. It can only be demonstrated by commitment and trust. Let me say that again. Faith is like love. It cannot be proved. It can only be demonstrated by commitment and trust. No person, when they say, do you love your spouse, just holds up their wedding ring. They say, I'm committed to this person for rich or for poor, in sickness and in health, for better or for worse. Love is a call to commitment, not a call to feelings. Amen. And so if you're in here this morning and you're taking a stock over your prayers of the last few weeks and you realize you've demanded a whole lot more in prayer than gratitude, here's the good news. Start thanking God today. Go into Sunday mornings. Go into your home groups and have gratitude in your prayers and in your teaching of God's word. A complaining heart is a hardened heart. Do you see church as a place to serve you or a place for you to come in and highly exalt Jesus as being the hands and the feet of Jesus? Do you come into the, do you come into the people of God to be served or to serve? Verses 14 through 21. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves of the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Friends, this is insult to injury. The smartest, most brilliant people of the word of God have radically rejected the Messiah. And here you've got the disciples, and what are they doing? They're arguing amidst one another. And he has a warning. Beware of the leaven. So what is leaven? It's a small, very small, tiny, you cannot see it, little thing that spreads and ruins the loaf. Leaven is only used positively in the New Testament once, and that's in Matthew chapter 13. All other places in the Bible and all other places uh, that of the writings of this time, leaven by the Jewish people was always used negatively, again, with the exception of Matthew chapter 13. 
So leaven is an evil thing. It's small, seemingly insignificant, but over time it grows and destroys. And so he talks about two groups of people. He talks about the Pharisees and Herod. So what is this leaven that Jesus is referring to? If you read Matthew's account, he goes on to say that it's the Pharisees' teaching. In Luke's account, he says that the leaven was their hypocrisy. So what do we do? Well, being this side, full, God's full word in our hands, we get to combine them all together and see that hardened hearts produce false teaching, produce hypocrisy, and end with a demand for a sign, a demand in worship. So this is the question we ask. Does our worship produce in us a love for others? Does your Bible reading soften your heart for the glory of God in others? Now, we may be tempted in here to think, how do these guys not get it? They just saw 4,000 people have been healed. They've seen a lot of amazing miracles of Jesus. How do these guys not get it? And I think that Mark has been trying to get this across to you and I the last five chapters or so. Faith is not built on intelligence. Why? Because Jesus just had the most smartest guys in the land reject them. Faith is built on two things, proximity and understanding. Proximity to Jesus should lead to understanding, and understanding should lead to proximity. Again, Mark is trying to compare and contrast our woman that we talked about last week. You remember? She came to Jesus, proximity, and she understood Jesus, yes, Lord. It is that proximity and understanding that led to that great active faith. She had an active faith. And here you have the disciples, and they think, we're close to Jesus. But they did not seek understanding. While you had the Pharisees seek understanding and lacking proximity. And they lorded themselves over Christ with demands. Pay attention to what and who you worship. For what and who you worship will always spread to others. Belief will spread, and so will unbelief. And this is why I say, oh, so many times to you and to me, over and over, make sure you have a ferocious, God-glorifying, Christ-exalting time with God each and every day. Without that, you will become spiritually anorexic. You will become spiritually dead without a daily devotion in prayer and God's word, without a private and corporate time of worship. You will wither and die, and your faith will never lead you to action. You'll be like a plant with no sunlight and no water. The greatest leaders in the kingdom of God were always attributed not for their skills, but for their worship. If you lean on your skills and neglect your worship, you will harden not only your hearts, but the hearts of others. The reason for that is because you cannot truly lead anyone to the glories of Christ without first experiencing the glory of Christ. We as a church have been so blessed to receive some just some young families. And I want to talk to those young families for just a moment. Young moms, young dads. I know there's some expecting Moms and dads coming. Um, no, it's not an announcement. Um, it's bad. Sorry, Molly. Um, <laughs> Lord, forgive me. Um, I, I want to just say to you, and I want to say it this way this morning. If you do not have a personal quiet time, a personal time with the Lord, you will be unable to show the glory of God to your children and to your family the most important thing for any young mom and young dad is to make sure they have a time with the Lord. Easy for you to say, you don't have the kids screaming in the morning. I'm just reading the mail. Find a way to have a ferocious time with the Lord because you cannot give what you have never received. And so recognize that the most important thing you can do for your family is to have a private and a corporate worship time, both, not either or. Now, what if I don't have a family? What if it's just me? I'm all alone. The principle still remains. Your belief or unbelief will spread. It will spread like leaven to those closest around you. If you have an identity of worship, if worship is who you are, then all who hang around you will want to worship with you. 
they'll desire to behold the glory in the way you do. And so are you leading people in unbelief or in faith? What does your private worship look like? Pose it another way. How do I know I'm a Pharisee or a disciple? Jesus left the Pharisees and the disciples. He's frustrated, but he's still hanging on. And we've seen this several times in Mark. If you see Jesus as useful, if you only see Jesus as here to fix your life, fix your marriage, fix your country, fix your enter the blank here, if you see Jesus as useful, you will never have a ferocious, quiet time of glorifying God. You must see Jesus as king. If you see Jesus as useful, you will miss the majesty and the greatness of God. You will be like the Pharisees. You've got to prove yourself to us. So Jesus here, he calls his disciples to understanding. Why? Because they're worried. We only have one loaf. And we're like, dudes, you guys just saw like him feed 4,000, 5,000. I think he could take care of 12 with one loaf. Easy for you and I to say that. When I know there's times in my life where I've worried about one little loaf and Jesus is saying, you've missed the glory. You've missed the majesty. These guys have missed because they're worried about the things of this world than the glory and the majesty of Christ. And so Jesus has a warning. Beware. Beware of false worship. Herod and the Pharisees emphasized the wrong things and it hardened their hearts. Their hearts were hardened and this spread to the disciples. You see, Jesus is brokenhearted because the Pharisees rejected him and the disciples are unaffected by it. So pay attention to what you're most passionate about. What do you think most about? What do you think deeply about? Do you think deeply about the glory of Christ and his cross? Do you think deeply about the greatness of salvation and Christ being high and lifted up and all that comes with that? Or do you think of the problems of this world more? Pastor, you've got your head in the sand. It's easy. You live in the ivory tower. I know all these things. My dear friends, they're important things, but they're not eternal things. Do you think about the eternal things of God? And if you could fix the problems of the world, Jesus, his death was unnecessary. So what do we do? We as people of God, we worship God and we trust that through our worship, God will make all things new. This is great glory. Fix your eyes on the cross. If the glory of Christ and his cross is absent in your worship, we'll be like the disciples, missing the glory of Christ and therefore missing Christ. And then we have our antidote. We have our antidote for the hardness of heart, and it's seen here in verse 18. Having eyes do not see, having ears do not hear, and do you not remember? Three things, see, hear, and remember, are antidotes in worship. First of all, see, and I'm not going to take Seth Ridge's sermon next week. He's going to take care of that because it's in the next story. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says this, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds. So blinded, there's eye language in there, the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The reason why people are blind to seeing the glory of Christ is because they're blinded. And there's one antidote for that, and it's found in the next part. Having ears do not hear. This is Romans, going again, Romans chapter 10, the call to hear the word of God. And this is an incredible warning for us. Do we hear the word of God? Do we hear what it says, or do we have selective hearing? Do we do theology buffet where we take and pick the things we like? But man, when that convicting passage just comes, we're like, "Mm, I don't think so. And then we kind of walk away. Do not play theology buffet because then you'll become theologically obese and faithfully anorexic. And then finally, the call to remember. Friends, do not, do not be the one telling other people's stories of faith. 
well, my friend did this and my friend did that and so-and-so did this and this church did that. Have the stories of how God has walked through you in moments of faith, how he has not left you or abandoned you. Remember those stories and tell them that God is faithful. Let those stories strengthen you that God has seen me through even the deepest valleys. And let that be preached. Do not tell other people's faith stories. Tell your own. So what do you do if you do not understand the kingdom of God? Let me share with you. This is why we have home groups. I tell you, I came in Tuesday and I was like, I have no idea how I'm going to explain Deuteronomy 21 through 24. But man, how God was so faithful to walk through a group of believers as we worked through those incredibly difficult passages together. Do not neglect that God has put you in a church. He has put you with other believers. Learn from them. Learn from them. We grow with one another and not apart from one another. God has designed his glory to be clearly seen through the church. So how do we live this on this passage on purpose? A few closing remarks for you. First, the Pharisees demanded a sign. Their teaching was hypocritical, and this caused hardness of hearts. The antidote for hypocrisy is first authenticity, being truly who you are. Great sin festers when people pretend to be who they are not. Right. Don't put on a face. Come in and say, hey, this is who I am. Next, accountability. Do you have someone you meet with regularly? Do you confess sins to one another? Do you ask them to reveal your shortcomings, your blind spots? Do you come together? Do you challenge one another to know God's word? Do you come together to read God's word together, to study God's word, to challenge each other, to memorize God's word and say, how are you doing putting that into practice? This is the antidote for hypocrisy. Next, knowledge without application leads to spiritual dullness. Application with no knowledge will lead to pride. We need to grow in both application and knowledge, not one or the other. I'm great in application, then bro, grow in knowledge. I'm great in knowledge, then bro, grow in application. These are never enemies. They're the breathing in and the breathing out of God's word. Application alone will cause you to cry out, look at me. Look at all that I'm doing for you, O oh God. While knowledge alone will cause you to be critical of others, will cause you to sit comfortably on the sidelines, and you'll find yourself being accusing others of their walk, and you will never actually be walking yourself. Finally, know that Christ is the one who opens our eyes, and God has removed the blindness of this world by dying on that cross. The cross is what destroys our blindness because we will see clearly our call not to be served, but to serve because that's what Christ did for us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for this incredibly convicting, sobering text this morning that you have called us to be righteous because you yourself are righteous. So Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the glories of the cross. We thank you that you have not left us, but you who began the good work see us all the way into completion. So Lord, we praise you and worship you this morning. Praise things in your son's name. Amen.